If you work with SwiftUI, you have a lot of property wrappers and sometimes it's difficult to decide which one to use for which situation. So I created this little decision tree that hopefully helps you to decide where which one would be useful. I added a link for this image so you can download it and use it later. So we have here a lot of property wrappers. It's nine and there's three new ones. Um, so the ones in yellow, they are the new ones, which you can only use for iOS 14 plus or macOS 11 plus. Okay, so let's start by looking into our little decision tree. So you have your stuff or data or however you want to call it. I just use the most generic word that I could find of it, just stuff. So the question is, is it simple stuff like uh, Boolean strings or arrays of strings? Or is it more complex? Like you have a view model where you fetch data from the web, where you do login states. So now we are going to look at what options you have if you have a more complex class. Then the next question is, do you want to use this view model more for a couple of views? So it's rather localized. Or are you going to use this view model for multiple views? You have some parent view and then further down in the hierarchy. So the sub view, sub view, sub view, somewhere there you want to use it. And you always have only one instance for all of this view block. If you're fine with having a rather localized view usage, you have the option to use state object and observable object. So the reason why it's more localized is because you have to hand down this observable object from one view to its children views in the initialize of the child views. So you always have to pass it downwards. And the moment you create an instance of this class or the view that is the owner of this view model or where you initialize this view model, there you have to use state object. And when you handle it down, wherever you want to give it access, wherever you want to use the same view model further down in some of your sub views, there you have to declare it at the edge observable object. But you wouldn't never, a good rule of thumb is never use initializer when you have add observable object. If you decide, okay, I'm, I know I only have one, maybe even for your whole application, like you, your fire, you have Firebase where you have a login state, you obviously have only one user all the time and one login uh, flow, so you wouldn't want to have multiple of these instances. In this case, it's a very good idea to use the environment. So the environment is another place outside of your views. You can place objects and properties in the environment and then in the environment of this view and its sub views, you can access again this environment object. How do you place it in the environment? For this, we use the environment object view modifier to the view and then it's accessible for this view and all its sub views. In order to access it back, you, need, you use add op environment object. So most of the time, if you have a view model or a observable object, it's always the question of state object, observable object and environment object. This gets a little bit more complicated. If you also want to support iOS 13, where you cannot use state object, you have to do a couple of, you have to be more smart about the way you um, use these objects. I will add a little mini series where I show you the example and why this is actually important to have a state object. So you see directly and how to do this workarounds. Okay, let's now go and see what happens when your stuff is more simple. So you have, for example, a Boolean value. And the next question that you, you should ask yourself, where do you declare your property? So if you declare this property inside of your view models or observable objects, then you have to use add published. So now let's have a look at what options you have if you want to place your property in the or your stuff in the view. There's two more new ones. And what they help you to do is store it in user default. So you can have uh, key value pairs uh, to store. For example, if you want to save uh, user preferences, if the user always want to see dark mode, you could use one of these at app, state, app storage or app scene storage. Set the, this property uh, is dark mode always here. And then if it is, is true. And the next time you launch your application, it is always the last value you set or the last value the user set. So it's actually quite nice way of also doing state restoration. So for the next app launch, then the question is, why do we have two different ones? If you want to save it in the user defaults and the simple answer is if you're on the I iPhone, it doesn't make a difference, but if you're on the iPad in split screen mode, 
if you're in Spitsky mode, you have two times two windows open for each instance of your application. And they are not called windows, they're called scenes. So let's imagine you have a notes app and you want to save which node the user selected currently. So next time the user relaunches the application, he directly sees the last selected node. Since you have two instances of your application running, or two scenes, you need to save two different user default values. That's the case when you use scene storage. If you, um, for example, want to save is always in dark mode, then you would you want to use app storage because it's supposed to be the same for both of your instances. It doesn't make sense that only one of your split screen views is in dark mode always. So these are quite useful for this, but you can always use user defaults by yourself if you want to support iOS 13. Okay, so the next one is you have your stuff, which is simple. It's in a view, it's temporary, like you have some kind of animations going on. You don't need to save them for next time. It just helps you to make a nice UI. You declare one property in a view and you want to change it. That's the main thing during runtime. Then you have to declare it at add state var. If you then want to use the same property in another sub view, you can do two options. Either you say, okay, my sub view only needs to have, it wants to only display it. This information like a text view only wants to have the text that is supposed to display. So the text inside the text view, you declare your text as a let text string value. However, if you have a sub view that wants to not only read this stuff to display it like a toggle, the toggle has two states, is it on or off? It wants to display, is it on or off? But it also, when the user taps on it, the, the toggle wants to change this value. And it also wants to pass this value back upwards to where you initially, so it wants to change the actual value, which is defined further up in the parent view. So the sub view would need to declare it at, at binding, which gives the sub view a read write access to this property. An easy rule of thumb is if you have a property where you say is equal to, and you want to change it, then it, it is the moment you should use at state. If you have a property which you get from somebody else, if you don't declare or set in this view, then it's at binding. You can either get a binding from a state, from a property that is declared as a state, so the state property. You can also get this from one of your observable objects. So I did here use it from the add state object, but it's also from the add observable object. Wherever you use the observable object with properties that are declared as published, you can also create bindings to these properties. And if you do these bindings, then it's when you use in order to give it to the sub view, then you use this dollar sign. So usually if you have a binding, it means dollar. Probably should add this to this view, so it's a bit better. So the last thing is, I also want to mention there's a kind of um, pattern that makes it easier for you to, um, to decide. So you have here the owner of a simple property and the read address to this with the binding you have and you have the same workflow. You have a state object, which is the owner, and it gives it access with a different property wrapper, which is an observable object. They actually, so in the beginning, they actually named this one in the very, I think in the beta, they named this one binding object. This one was object binding. If you think of the observable object as a binding object, you see the pattern a lot better between state and binding, state object and binding object. Uh, so you always have these two pairs and the difference is just if I have an observable object, I use object wrapper so-and-so object. If it's simple, I use directly state and binding. So you at least can distinguish these two pairs because they usually come in this kind of pairs. The environment is quite similar. The difference is because you only have one instance of this observable object in this environment. It's clear that when you place it there, you don't need to say, okay, I want to have this in this ex uh, instance. There's just one there. And you would use add environment object in the similar way as observ observed object. I hope this made it a little bit clearer what kind of stuff you can have and how to handle your stuff. You can find a link for this image in the description box. I will make a little mini series where we have some examples of where to use which one and what happens if you use 
the other one, like why would you use state object versus observable object. So if you are interested in this, subscribe to this channel so you are not missing any of them. Don't, forgi don't forget to give this video a like if you enjoyed what you learned and you want to see more.